The Gone Cold Podcast may contain violent or graphic subject matter. Listener discretion is advised. About 200 miles west of the dead center of San Antonio lies the tiny, sleepy town of Loma Alta in Valverde County. It's the type of place where you might hear the old joke, blink and you'll miss it, while traveling through. Only, in the case of Loma Alta, it would be more of a warning than a quip. The town was formed in 1906 by brothers Ray, Lynn, and Emery Davis, who sought to take advantage of the area's wide-open space and try their hand at ranching while raising their families there. Loma Alta never caught on as a destination spot for homesteaders. The population was only 30 as of the 2000 census, and a small gas station slash convenience store is the only obvious attraction you'll find there. But if you look close enough while driving through Loma Alta on U.S. Highway 277, you'll also find a memorial dedicated to five people who died there. It was erected by Peter Gomez Sr., a resident of Sonora, Texas, about 35 miles north of where the monument sits. Passers-by who don't know any better might think the site is honoring the victims of a terrible car crash. In reality, though, it's the memorial of an event that was so unimaginably horrific and gruesome. It's haunted Gomez since 1968, when he was working for the highway department widening the isolated and lonely stretch of Highway 277 near there. The memorial marks the site of the massacre of five people and the attempted slaying of a sixth, a place where an entire family fell victim to the senseless brutality of a merciless devil whose evil seems incomprehensible to any whose character contains even the smallest bit of humanity. On Tuesday, April 16, 1968, Juan Manuel Ariano Sr. heard the thumping of a flat tire as he drove his blue four-door 1958 Buick Special on a desolate stretch of U.S. Highway 277. Juan and his family were just 40 miles north of the border of Mexico, where he and his wife Monica, both 25 years old, had loaded their three children into the vehicle in Villa de Fuente, a town not too far south of Piedras Negras, which is directly across the Rio Grande River from Eagle Pass, Texas. Just after one stopped and got out to correct the problem, a couple highway workers checked to make sure everything was okay, and since it was just a flat, Juan told them that everything was fine. He switched the tire out with the spare, and they were back on the road in no time. It was about 6 p.m., and the family continued their way down the lonesome road to visit Juan's sister in San Angelo, Texas, about 190 miles away from their home in Villa de Fuente. She was with child, and the Ariano family was anticipating the birth. Juan's other sister, 21-year-old Rosa Alia, who also lived in Villa de Fuente, accompanied her brother, sister-in-law, niece, and nephews on the trip. The children, five-year-old Juan Manuel Jr., who was known as Manuel by the family, two-and-a-half-year-old Leticia, and 15-month-old Eduardo, were eager to make the trek to see their expecting aunt and uncle. The Arianos had plenty of relatives in Texas, and in fact, one of Juan's brothers-in-law, Raymond Garza, was in the running for Zavala County Sheriff. Juan's 58 Buick promoted his brother-in-law's campaign with election stickers as well as Texas license plates. The United States was as familiar to Juan as Mexico. He was a migrant worker and had done plenty of farm work up in Iowa, where he worked summers at a turkey processing plant. Both he and Monica spoke fluent English. The trip to see family was normal, 
except for the few issues that arose during their journey. About five miles up the road from where Juan had just fixed the Buick's flat tire, another tire on the car went flat. The spare had already been used, of course, so the family waited around, hoping someone passing through would stop and give them a lift to the nearest auto garage to get the tire patched up. Someone did finally come upon them, a man in a pickup, who gave the Ariano family a ride 30 miles up Highway 277 to Sonora. As they waited for the tire to be fixed, Juan and Manuel hitched over to a nearby restaurant on foot and picked up some hamburgers. After the tire was repaired, the good Samaritan who'd picked them up had the family pile into his vehicle so he could take them back to the abandoned Buick. It was approximately 10 p.m., The following morning, Wednesday, April 17, 1968, a hand employed by the W.R. Lee Whitehead Ranch noticed what appeared to be blood extending from one of the ranch's gates into the brush. He followed the trail, which appeared to be leading to a large tree that stood nearby. The ranch hand stopped dead in his tracks as he glanced down in a tall patch of weeds at a boy lying face down covered in blood, dirt, and gravel. The boy, whose back appeared ripped with slash wounds and barely conscious, begged the man for water. The boy was five-year-old Manuel Ariano. Police arrived on the scene soon thereafter and began combing the area. Inside the barbed wire fence that ran alongside U.S. Highway 277, About 75 yards from the road and close to a water trough in the pasture there, they found the body of a man, Juan Sr. Not far from Juan's body laid a baby, 15-month-old Eduardo, who was deceased. In the gravel and brush where rattlesnakes slither and armadillos lay low to scavenge for food, a small girl was found, two-and-a-half-year-old Leticia. She was severely injured, but still alive. Ambulances rushed Leticia and Manuel away to nearby hospitals. About a mile south of where Juan Sr.'s body was found, in a ditch just around 30 yards off Highway 277, the body of his wife, Monica, was discovered. As detectives further inspected the immediate area surrounding Monica, They found clothes torn and scattered, and Juan's sister Rosa's naked and lifeless body lying in the brush and weeds a few feet away. Valverde County Sheriff's Office investigators had never seen anything like this before. They were in shock and overcome by emotion at the sight of this massacre, and, of course, they were appalled and angry that the children, one a helpless 15 month old baby, were included in the malicious massacre that the depraved perpetrator had orchestrated. It looked like the work of a maniac, Sheriff Herman Richter remarked in disbelief. Whoever did it, he said, had to be crazy. Five-year-old Manuel was taken to a hospital in Del Rio. He was conscious, and though his injuries were quite severe, He'd been stabbed four times and suffered a gunshot to the back of his head. Doctors assessed that his condition was serious, but fair enough that he could be moved to a facility that could better treat him. He was transported by helicopter to an intensive care unit at Santa Rosa Medical Center in San Antonio for further treatment. Two-and-a-half-year-old Leticia's injuries, however, were incredibly serious. The young girl struggled to hold on to life, and transporting her anywhere, whether the facility was equipped to deal with the situation or not, was out of the question. Leticia had to remain at the hospital that she'd originally been taken to in Sonora. She had been repeatedly stabbed and beaten, the right side of her body paralyzed as the result of a gunshot wound between her eyes. Autopsies were performed on Juan Sr., Monica, Rosa, and baby Eduardo. Juan had been shot, stabbed, and beaten. 
Monica was shot and stabbed. Juan's young sister Rosa had been raped and subsequently stabbed to death. 15-month-old Eduardo was stabbed in the back three times. Though doctors were hopeful at first, remarking that she had responded well to stimulants, Juan and Monica's daughter, Leticia, succumbed to her wounds two days after the attack against the Ariano family. The murder of the Ariano family shook authorities to their core, but they wasted little time organizing a large-scale manhunt for the killer. A monster who was capable of such a thing remaining on the loose was too much for the departments to bear. They held out hope, too, that Manuel would pull through not only for the sake of the young boy's life, but also thinking that he would be able to provide them information as to the killer or killer's identity. Fields, ditches, wooded areas, and roads were combed over for clues, but ultimately the police were left scratching their heads. At this point, investigators thought that the family had stopped to fix the tire. Someone pulled up and acted as a good Samaritan before slaying them all. Although detectives knew that the firearm used was 22 caliber, they did not know if the weapon was a rifle or a pistol. Investigators did find tire tracks that they presumed to be those of the perpetrator's vehicle near the family's 1958 Buick, which was still sitting with a flat tire around eight miles from where the Ariano's bodies were found. The pockets of Juan's blue jeans were pulled inside out, but investigators were not convinced the motive for these slangs was robbery. They theorized instead that the pockets were pulled out with the intention of making it look that way. The Texas Rangers sent out three of their own to assist. A.Y. Alley Jr., who followed his great-grandfather, grandfather, and father's footsteps becoming a Texas Ranger, began leading the investigation. Ali was as seasoned and as tough as Rangers come and he certainly looked it in his 10-gallon cowboy hat, blue jeans, and six-shooter strapped to his side. When he took over, he hit the ground running. Fingerprints from the Ariano's Buick were given to the Department of Public Safety and checked against prints in police files from around the state. There was some confusion as to the identity of Rosa, as she had crossed the border using a passport that bore the name Maria Cantu presumably a family member or friend. Deputies were ultimately able to locate a family member who identified her body and the other bodies of their loved ones. Raymond Garza's opponent in the race for Zavala County Sheriff, C.L. Sweeten, was tasked with telling him of his sister-in-law, Monica, and her family member's unimaginable demise, and he and his wife, Monica's sister, were doing everything they could to go to San Antonio to stay with Manuel in the hospital. But the distraught couple were also tasked with making funeral arrangements for Juan, Monica, Leticia, Rosa, and baby Eduardo. Raymond Garza later told the San Antonio Express that he didn't think the motive could have possibly been robbery. His brother-in-law's family was modest, and Juan rarely carried much cash or anything valuable. He was unemployed at the time and only drew a modest unemployment check of $56 a week. Garza told them that Juan was a nobleman who was honest and hardworking, and the family struggled with the idea that anyone would want to hurt him or the rest of the family, particularly the children. The funerals were held in Villa Fuente, Mexico, where Juan and Rosa's parents lived. Law enforcement utilized the media to plea for the public's help in obtaining information, and it worked. Witnesses who had seen the family and the man who was thought to have slain them began coming forward after the murders were reported in the press. An oil-filled bus lines driver, who drove the rope where the Ariano's Buick sat with a flat tire, told police that, at about 7 p.m. on the night before their bodies were found, he saw the family, their car, a white man in a cowboy hat, and a white pickup truck on his way south to Del Rio. 
He described this man with a cowboy hat as having sandy hair with freckles or liver spots on his forehead, having a light complexion, and wearing cowboy attire. The bus driver remarked that he wore fancy boots. He also told police that he noticed the Ariano's vehicle again on his way back up north later that night, but no one was around the Buick. David Lorden, the service station attendant in Sonora, who repaired the Ariano's flat tire there, also came forward. Lorden told investigators that they arrived there in a 1967 Fleet Side Series 10 pickup truck that was green or blue with a white top. The man who was driving the truck, he said, was white, stood about 6 feet 2 inches tall, and weighed somewhere around 200 pounds. The man's hair was sandy color, and there were pockmarks, or possibly a rash, on his neck. His cowboy boots had an eagle design on the side, Lorden told police, and he wore a western shirt and a straw cowboy hat. He was about 30 to 35 years old, the service station attendant speculated. A hunting knife hung from the man's belt. A composite sketch was made and released in the papers. The Texas Department of Public Safety issued a nationwide alert to law enforcement to be on the lookout for such a man. That alert suggested that officers look closely at vehicles they stop for bloodstains. And since Juan's wallet was missing, the alert highlighted that officers should look specifically for it when an individual garnered suspicion. Several witnesses came forward with a similar description of a man who'd been hanging around Sonora for a few days before the slayings, all saying he dressed in elaborate cowboy clothing. But none had seen him since the massacre. Texas Ranger A.Y. Alley Jr., along with both Valverde County Sheriff's Office and Edwards County Sheriff's Office deputies, brought in several individuals for questioning. However, David Lorden, the service station attendant, couldn't identify any of them as the man who'd driven the Ariano family to his station. A Mexican national who had come across the detective's radar was found sleeping alongside a road close to Del Rio, though it only took a brief line of questioning for police to rule him out. No leads the cops explored were panning out. Two weeks after the attack, Manuel was able to communicate with remarkable clarity considering the injuries he had sustained and the multiple head and brain operations he underwent. His hearing was significantly damaged by the gunshot to his head, and the boy spoke only Spanish, so investigators scattered to find an interpreter, but not before setting up protection for young Manuel. The man who would set up the highway side monument years after the tragedy, Peter Gomez, had a younger sister who worked as a registered nurse at the San Antonio Hospital where Manuel's life was saved. She told the San Angelo Standard Times that day and night, a police guard stood by the door of the room where the boy laid recovering, and because of her, they did not have to continue their search for an interpreter either. The young nurse's husband spoke fluent Spanish and English and was more than willing to help. Arrangements were made to get him there quickly. Manuel was a little confused but began telling police what he knew. He told investigators that the white man, a big cowboy, he called him, began shooting his gun out of the window of the pickup on the way back from getting the Ariano's tire patched in Sonora. Edwards County Sheriff Tom Henderson, who shared jurisdiction of the crime with Valverde County Sheriff Herman Richter, had to piece together the details of what Manuel was telling investigators with known details of the crime scene to make sense of what happened. The result of the collaboration is nothing short of horrifying. Manuel told them that the big cowboy was shooting at deer and rabbits after headlighting them, meaning he'd shoot the animals after they froze at the sight of the truck's headlights. 
Juan Ariano became upset by this. It was presumably scaring his wife, sister, and especially the young children, and he told the man to stop. The big cowboy did not stop shooting, but stopped the vehicle. He'd just shot a deer on the other side of a barbed wire fence, and, the boy recalled, demanded Juan accompany him to retrieve the fallen animal. Once they were near the deer, about 75 yards from Highway 277, Juan's wife, sister, and children witnessed in the glow of headlights the big cowboy point his weapon at Juan and fire. The cowboy quickly returned to the pickup, where the Ariano family was screaming in terror. He then beat, shot, and stabbed them all. He threw two of the children over the fence. Manuel was either thrown in front of the fence or was able to run several feet from the pickup. This detail is unclear, and the big cowboy climbed in the truck and drove off with both Monica and Rosa, either dead or clinging to life. He dumped their bodies about a mile away, but not before raping Rosa. Young Manuel was released from the hospital into his uncle Raymond Garza's care on Monday, May 6, 1968. After a miraculous recovery, Garza told reporters that police supplied the boy with a photo lineup and he pointed one out, saying, I know that man. Manuel added to the description of the man, telling investigators that he had heavy shoulders and slim hips and that the knife he carried was bone-handled. Few other details of the boy's statement to police have been publicized. The next promising lead came from Fort Worth on Monday, May 13, 1968. Police there contacted Texas Ranger A.Y. Ali Jr. with something potentially huge after stopping two men in a car because the vehicle's muffler was defective. The driver of the automobile had two driver's licenses, both expired, one from Texas and one from Colorado. The men were detained after officers, who were aware of the national bulletin that had been put out in search of the slayer of the Ariano family. When they found that the men were in possession of a billfold that contained the identification of a Mexican national, about 160 pesos, and a 22 caliber pistol. One of the men, in particular, had officers' attention. He was 40 years old, his hair dyed black recently from a sandy brown color, and he wore cowboy boots etched with eagles on the sides. Ranger Ali quickly gathered David Lorden, the service station attendant, back in Sonora, and along with Ranger Arthur Hill, and Edwards County Sheriff Tom Henderson headed north. Fort Worth police were ready for their guests with a lineup when they arrived. Lorden did not have to look hard. He told investigators that neither of the men even came close to the man he had seen with the Ariano family shortly before they were slain. Texas Rangers and the Valverde County Sheriff's Office exhausted leads spending months trying to track down either a white pickup, a green pickup with a white top, or a blue pickup with a white top, in which the owner matched the description of the cowboy seen by so many. In September of 1969, Valverde County Sheriff Herman Richter was forced to dispel rumors in the Del Rio News Herald that the murderer had been caught and charged. This report began in newspapers in Mexico, and the news quickly made it across the border. But, of course, no killer was in custody. Sheriff Richter told a reporter that similar news had been reported some time before, wishful thinking, perhaps, on the part of those who so desperately wanted justice. And anyway, he and many sheriffs after continued having to dispel rumors for decades. Over the next several months, police nailed down several persons of interest who they sought to either eliminate or take a closer look at. But they had a huge problem. Their best witness was nowhere to be found. 
David Lorden, the service station attendant who repaired the family's second flat tire in Sonora, had been arrested on forgery charges and held in a Sonora jail. The perfect, though unfortunate, place for such a witness to be. But he escaped that facility with another man held there on February 28, 1969. The two had somehow obtained a guard's rifle, made their escape, and both fled the area. Texas law enforcement's luck soon changed, however, when in November 1969, San Francisco, California authorities contacted them with news that Lorden had been taken into custody there. He was extradited back to Texas. Police told the press that Lorden was cleared as a suspect in the Ariano family murders and that he was a material witness. Lucky for them again, he was now being held on several charges that guaranteed he wouldn't be released on bond. After his escape, he was a flight risk. Police told reporters that they needed Lorden to see a particular suspect that was being held in a Johnson County jail and maybe make an identification. Reporters were either skeptical or were simply performing their due diligence when they called the Johnson County Sheriff for information on the man the department supposedly held. The sheriff there told them that he was holding no such man at the time. It's unclear how many persons of interest were ruled out by Lorden, or who they were, or if he was ever able to positively identify one. By 1982, activity on the Ariano family slayings had gone cold. Frozen, in fact. Then, in 1999, the Texas Department of Public Safety received a call from an individual who claimed to know who was responsible for the massacre of the Ariano family. As a result, the long-filed away and reportedly gigantic stack of documentation on the case was pulled out and reviewed. Texas Rangers poured through every detail so that they could decide whether or not the caller was providing reliable information. And though they ultimately could not find the evidence they needed to confirm the tip, the investigators realized that the case needed to be looked at with fresh eyes. Texas Ranger Sergeant Brooks Long told a reporter for the LA Times, in fact, that the investigation prior to this tip wasn't even in the ballpark, but was now sitting on third base. Sergeant Brooks had tracked down some witnesses who saw the Arianos and the man with whom they were last seen, including the ranch hand who found the bodies of the family. Brooks even attempted to locate the Arianos Buick, but was unsuccessful on that front. Incredibly, and in stark contrast to many cases as old as this one, pieces of physical evidence still existed, and at least one DNA profile was obtained. DNA from the Ariano murders was compared against an incarcerated man in California who'd committed what police called a similar crime, but there was no match. As a part of the renewed investigation, Sergeant Long found Manuel who had been raised by his grandmother in Mexico after the rest of his family was slaughtered. He was still in Mexico in 2006 when Long tracked him down. Manuel, 42 years old at the time, had a family of his own now, a wife and children, and was leading a relatively normal and very successful life working in the financial industry. Manuel showed Sergeant Long the scars from the stab wounds that still remained, but he had virtually no memory of what happened on that day in April of 1968. Although Texas Rangers told a reporter in 2006 that they were hopeful, the slangs of the Ariano family remain unsolved. If you have any information on the 1968 murders of the Ariano family, please contact the Edwards County Sheriff's Office at 830-683-4104. The Los Angeles Times, the Del Rio News Herald, the San Antonio Express, the Austin Statesman, and the San Angelo Standard Times were used as sources for this episode. 
you can support the show at patreon.com forward slash gone cold podcast. There, you can get the show ad-free and enjoy Patreon-exclusive episodes that tell stories of mostly solved Texas crimes and the bad actors who perpetrated them. I get those out as much as I can, which is not as often as I would like. Another way you can support Gone Cold is by leaving us a five-star rating and written review on iTunes or wherever else you listen. Thank you in advance. Those reviews help Gone Cold's visibility, which helps new listeners find us, which increases the potential for someone with information hearing the show and reporting what they know to authorities. Thanks for listening, y'all.